Well, hello and welcome to another episode of In Conversation with Benedict Rogers, uh, an interview series uh, produced by Hong Kong Watch. And it's a, a huge uh, privilege and, and pleasure to welcome as our guest today, uh, one of Hong Kong Watch's patrons, uh, Canadian Senator Leo Housakos. Uh, Senator Leo Housakos was uh, appointed to the Senate of Canada by the then Prime Minister Stephen Harper in 2009. Uh, and served as Speaker of the Senate uh, in 2015. He's a, a real champion of human rights in China and Hong Kong, uh, has introduced uh, or supported several uh, bills in the Canadian uh, Senate to defend freedom and human rights, including a bill to, to block imports from uh, the Xinjiang region where Uyghur forced labor uh, is used in supply chains, and a bill to establish a foreign influence registry. And he's a great friend to both the people of Hong Kong and to us in Hong Kong Watch. So, uh, Senator Husakas, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Rogers, for uh, for inviting me on. It's a great pleasure. Let me start by asking, um, why and, and when did you first get involved with the issue of human rights in China and in particular Hong Kong? Look, my interest in human rights goes back to the fact of why I'm in politics. I'm in politics because I love our democracy, I love our freedom, and I love what it brings us. I'm a child of immigrants. My, my parents immigrated from Greece in the 1950s to Canada in search of, uh, of a better opportunity for, for their children. They left a worn, torn, economically depressed a region of the world, a beautiful part of the world nonetheless, and they left out of necessity, as millions have done, to come to our great country. And I don't take our freedoms for granted. And we shouldn't, us who get to enjoy those freedoms in the Western democracies that we live in. And we should look around the world to those that are not afforded the same rights and privileges and say to ourselves, why not? Absolutely. That's, uh, that's a very powerful uh, answer. Turning to... Um the situation today. What is your assessment of what both Canada and the rest of the uh, free world has done in response to the dismantling of Hong Kong's freedoms by the Chinese regime? And what more should be done? Look, I think democracy is in peril. We see what's going on in Hong Kong and in other places in the world. And uh, I think it's uh, we should be compelled to take action and to not turn a blind eye and bury our heads in the sand and pretend it's, it's not happening. Uh, I always say to people that if you don't engage in politics and take an interest in politics, God forbid one day if politics takes an interest in you and you're not ready for it. What is going on in Hong Kong is just deplorable. Hong Kong was a beacon of, of, of hope and, and an example of where freedom, democracy, and free enterprise, when they come together, they do great things. And we've seen, because of the political circumstances, that beacon of hope um, in that region, and more importantly, that that diamond uh, in the rough that was created that we knew once upon a time was Hong Kong, is in peril now. And the people of Hong Kong, like all human beings, deserve the right to freedom, deserve the right to govern themselves, and deserve the right to have human respect. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Canada, alongside um, my country, the United Kingdom, uh, has probably been the leading country in providing a, a lifeboat scheme for Hong Kongers uh, to get out of Hong Kong and to find uh, freedom. Um, why is it important, in your view, that the government of Canada uh, both continue, but also extend and expand uh, the open work permit scheme for Hong Kongers, which I believe is up for renewal very soon. It is up for renewal, and I'm proud to say that our uh, leader of the Conservative opposition in Canada has uh, declared that we should extend and broaden, of course, the program. Uh, why? It's very simple. Uh, we have such close ties between Canada and Hong Kong. Uh, there's uh, there's 150,000 Hong Kongers of Canadian uh, origin and Canadian citizenry that are living in Hong Kong. Uh, so we have to make sure that uh, 
uh, our, our citizen, our, our rights to our citizens are protected. And as I said in the introduction to your first question, uh, human rights and freedom doesn't belong to any one nation or one system. It should be universal. And what is going on right now to the people of Hong Kong who are just simply asking for freedom and self-determination. Uh, and they're being encroached right now and trampled with a boot to the throat by what I consider to be the largest and, and most egregious authoritarian regime in the world right now. There are problems with authoritarianism around the world, but there is no greater threat to democracy right now and to that particular region than the communist Chinese regime. Mm, absolutely. Um, I'd like to ask your view on the issue of, of sanctions, because um, so far, uh, only the United States has introduced uh, targeted sanctions, Magnitsky sanctions, on those responsible for dismantling Hong Kong's uh, freedoms and, and autonomy, um, and particularly in, in uh, breach of an international treaty, the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Uh, do you think um, Canada and the United Kingdom and others should be looking at, at sanctions now? Look, absolutely. Um, and and we've seen both now the Biden and Trump regime uh, pussyfooting around, talking a good game. They have implemented some sanctions, granted. Probably they've gone a lot further than Canada has, to my dismay. Uh, Canada is an example of uh, a democracy in the world that always expresses our concern and dismay uh, at all the egregious behavior of the communist Beijing regime, but we never back it up with any action. Um, and it's a deep concern of mine. Uh, we we see what's going on to the Uyghur people in China. We see what is happening in Hong Kong. We see the existential threat that China is posing on Taiwan. Um, we constantly see the threats that China is is uh, is throwing towards our own democracies here in Canada, when our parliaments try to express themselves on issues, for example, what's going on with the Uyghurs or, or, or our friends in Hong Kong, there is aggressive and public pushback. We've had a Chinese ambassador in Ottawa threatening Canadian parliamentarians with retaliation because they don't like certain motions or pieces of legislation we're putting forward. How outrageous is that? And yet, instead of our government calling these this particular ambassador uh, to the carpet and saying, hey, this is not acceptable, we, we express our dismay in a very veiled fashion. And then our Canadian government goes about its regular business of bilateral research agreements and trade agreements. Um, you know, in this country, we, we have lithium. We have a, a, a lithium plant our only lithium plant, and we know how important lithium is in today's modern world, and it's owned and operated by a Chinese state corporation. Mm. How outrageous is that? Mm. How, how much disregard can the Trudeau Canadian government show in protecting our security interests? So I am I'm concerned that not enough has been done, and I've been one of those voices who's gone, I've been accused of going to the extreme uh, when I say we should completely decouple completely our economic relationships with China until they align themselves with our Western values. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in addition to the really important examples that you've just highlighted, there are, of course, I, I'm sure, many Hong Kong officials and uh, officials from the Beijing regime that have assets in Canada, property or, or other assets. Is there more that could and should be done to, to track that down and, and, and freeze those assets? Well, first, as you know, Ben, I have S-237 in the Senate of Canada, which is a piece of legislation uh, tight, demanding that the government tightens up foreign influence in this country. Uh, and, and of course, Canada is a very porous nation when it comes to our national security uh, tools uh, and and it's clear and it's not just facing threats from China we we've seen the uh, threats coming from Russia from Iran uh, and other authoritarian regimes around the world and we haven't done enough um, so you know we need to tighten up when it comes to foreign influence in this country and make sure that they understand that they're 
they cannot penetrate our institutions, our universities, our parliaments, our government uh, as easily as uh, as they have. Um, and furthermore, uh, China also has to be sent a message that every time they infringe upon the freedoms of our friends and allies, as they're doing in Hong Kong, that there will be a price to pay. They can't continue to be getting unfettered access to Western Europe's rich middle-class consumer market, the Canadian rich middle-class consumer market, and of course, the enormous uh, middle-class market of the United States without them having aligned themselves when it comes to environment, labor, human rights, democracy, all the things that we expect uh, as as the basis of the, the foundation of our societies, that they uh, completely combat on a regular basis, they think is an anathema, should be front and center before we engage in commercial exchange with that regime. Absolutely. I, I was going to ask you about uh, uh, the foreign influence uh, legislation. Could, could you talk us through a little bit in a little bit more detail where that is at um, and what the approach of, of the current government is? Because I've, I've heard that they are now perhaps a little bit more open to doing something and they're consulting on it, I, I believe. Every time China does something or whenever there's a, a case uh, that's become a, a flashpoint, of Chinese influence. And uh, about a month and a half ago, we had a, maybe two months ago, we had a case of a senior official at Hydro Quebec, which is a public a hydro utility corporation in the province of Quebec. And there was a, a an individual who was charged and now is before courts of law, a, a, a Chinese spy essentially, who was caught spying uh, on Hydro Quebec. There was a lot of media attention. There was a lot of public outcry of just another example of how China has no boundaries when it comes to attacking uh, and 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 stealing Canadian technology of all sorts. Uh, and in the heat of that particular moment, we had Minister Mendocino, the public security minister, say that, that Bill S-204 was a good bill, something that needed to be looked at and that the government would be reviewing, quote unquote, uh, what needs to be done in combating foreign influence. Well, we've had two scientists that were fired from our Winnipeg viral uh, biology lab a couple of years ago, where clearly China was spying on our operations there on dealing with, uh, with COVID. There's been a, a number of examples now of other cases, Nortel, which was a flagship software corporation in this country fell apart and it's well documented today in large part because the Chinese infiltrated Nortel. They stripped it of its uh, patents and technological capacity and they went on and in large part created Huawei at our expense. Mm. It has been well documented. And after all that, not to mention the fact we've had the RCMP, parliamentary committees, R5, I, ally sharing information of, of espionage that the Chinese conduct at our expense. And after all that, what we get from the Minister of Public Security, it is something we need to look at. And mm -hmm. thus, what is of such concern to me, we need to back it up with action. In the meantime, while he says the right things publicly that we need to be uh, careful about the threat of China in our democracy, my bill is lingering in the Senate of Canada because the majority chamber, which has been appointed by right now, and, and, and the chambers dominated by a majority Trudeau appointed senator, senators do not move on the bill. Mm. So rhetoric on the one hand is fantastic and concern. On the other hand, inaction is much more worrisome from my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Can I ask your um, views on another aspect of, of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, infiltration and intimidation, which is... Um, the reports in Canada and indeed around the world of these secret Chinese police stations. What is Canada doing about that? Uh, ben, uh, again, so far nothing, unless and we hope that the RCMP is taking action. We haven't seen the fruits of that labor yet. Uh, they claim that they are investigating. They've confirmed the operation of these police cells right here in Canada in cities like Toronto. Uh, where the Beijing re regime is using these centers with operatives on our land to intimidate Chinese Canadians 
for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we're well aware of, Canada has become a money laundering hub for mainland China. And I've been saying this over and over again, that our government has to wake up because we are going to become nothing more than an international ATM machine mm -hmm. for offspring of authoritarian uh, regimes and dictatorships around the world that come to Canada to launder their money and to operate. And we, we know specific cases now where Chinese uh, regime is sending officers here in Canada in order to recuperate uh, their, their former citizens or Chinese mainland Chinese uh, Canadians that are living here who are clearly fleeing that regime and they're fleeing with what they believe is the fruit of their labor, their, their money. And, but of course we all know that the communist regime in China believes that uh, the money of all Chinese people belong to China and don't belong to, to the actual people that, that possess the funds. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know it's a complicated story, but that's in reality what's going on. The, 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 and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very messy situation because the Canadian government uh, is welcoming these individuals because they know full well they were bringing in currency to the country. Uh, but it's also probably contributed in large part to the biggest problem facing Canada right now economically, which is inflation. Because mm -hmm. when you have too much, too many dollars chasing too few goods, that, of course, creates inflation in a nutshell. So if young Canadians today cannot afford in Toronto to buy a condominium or a home or in places like Vancouver, it's because of this influx of currency and money that has come in to our country, unfettered, mm -hmm. uh, without any strategic plan. And, uh, and what has also brought with it is inadvertently a Chinese government that believes that Canada somehow, the moment that these individuals and these funds arrive in the country, they have some kind of right to it, mm -hmm. where they, they they can set parameters and guidelines, uh, which in itself is, is mind-numbing when you think about how emboldened China has become over the last few years. We mm -hmm. see it again in Taiwan. They 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 are they're not shy about clamping down on all sorts of civil freedoms. We see how belligerent they've become towards Taiwan. We've seen how belligerent they've become towards India in terms of some of the border skirmishes that have occurred. Uh, and again, it's as if the West is oblivious to this behavior because we are so addicted to cheap goods on the mm -hmm. one hand. And some of our multinational corporations have turned free labor and the lack of it, environmental parameters in China, which they have to face in our countries, they've turned that into a monetary bonanza for themselves. Mm. Mm. So we're facing pressure on two fronts. We're facing pressure from the fact that our citizens have become addicted to cheap products. But more importantly, we also have some large corporations. doesn't matter if it's Nike, Apple, we can go on and on and on, Volkswagen, uh, mm -hmm. that have the NBA, the National Basketball Association. These are all entities that have become addicted to revenue from China. Yeah. I recently found out that McGill University has invested enormous amount of money into Chinese uh, pension funds mm -hmm. and, and investment companies. And I'm saying to myself, my God, once upon a time, our university institutions used to be a place where we would have open, frank discussions, debate, and research was done on existential problems facing humanity in the world. And today, it seems that they're more preoccupied with their foundations and funding than they are some of these important issues of academic importance and intellectual importance and human importance. Mm. Mm. It's becoming very concerning. Mm. Absolutely. We have a similar issue in the UK. In fact, the Times newspaper here in the UK had a, a big expose just a few days ago of more than 40 British universities that have of varying types uh, agreements with Chinese uh, institutions that are not just affiliated to the Chinese Communist Party, but but are actually engaged in either uh, the genocide of the Uyghurs or indeed in in research on 
uh, military uh, issues that one day they they may well use to uh, to threaten us. Um, so it's uh, it is extraordinary how how far down that path we've allowed ourselves to go. Um, let let me turn as a penultimate question uh, turn back to the situation in Hong Kong uh, because um, this year. Uh, there are at least two very big uh, trials taking place under the national security law. Uh, the trial of um, the 47 uh, former legislators and uh, activists uh, who who were arrested and charged simply with the crime of uh, having held a, a primary election to choose their candidates. Uh, that trial is coming up. Um, and then later in the year, of course, the trial of uh, Jimmy Lai, the founder of uh, Apple Daily, who of course has served already uh, several years in prison uh, on other charges, but he faces his big national security law charge. I, I wonder if you comment on both these trials. Uh, as a legislator yourself, how do you feel when you see former legislators uh, prosecuted for holding a a, a primary? Uh, and, and how do you feel about the significance of Jimmy Lai's case? Look, uh, in both these instances where you have legislators and you have journalists uh, being charged simply because they question authority. Can you imagine how many, how busy our courts would be in our democracies if legislators and journalists who question government activity were, were hauled before the court? I mean, it's outrageous. And the national security law uh, is, is I'm afraid, just the first loud draconian step that mainland China is, uh, is taking in order to basically align Hong Kong completely to mainland China's system. That's, that's the reality. Um, so, and we all know right now the, 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 the judicial system in Hong Kong is, is a, kangaroo process uh we you know uh, we have a former canadian supreme court justice right now who's serving on the highest tribunal in hong kong uh and and she's become an apologist for the world's largest and most evil authoritarian regime and there's been mild pushback from Canadian media, academics, politicians. Uh, there's been some, but the the apologists for Beijing is just overwhelming, even in our own, own shores here, our own land. Um, mm. And like I said, they had the power, you know, follow the money. If you want to see why things are evolving the way they're evolving, I always say, follow the money. And um, and that and you'll it'll it'll shed a lot of light on a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there are so many other uh, questions and and aspects to this topic that uh, we could discuss, but we're coming towards the end of of this episode. I'd like to ask you finally, what message you would like to give to viewers, um, especially Hong Kongers, whether they are. Uh, actually still in Hong Kong or in the diaspora uh, around the world? Well, the first message is thank you for the opportunity to, to communicate on this, uh, on this particular pr program and uh, give me the opportunity to send my message out to Hong Kong supporters around the world. And let me thank you, Benedict, for your work. You are genuinely uh, a hero of mine. Uh, I am a great admirer of Hong Kong Watch. I'm privileged that you've asked me to be one of Hong Kong Watch's patrons. Uh, you help me very much in, in as a springboard to propel the work I do in the Senate of Canada uh, in defense of human rights, in defense of the people of Hong Kong, and to push back against authoritarianism, uh, both in that region and against China, but around the world. And uh, I, I commend you for that. And the message I have is we cannot lose hope. We need to be a voice for those who feel they don't have a voice. We need to see, uh, you know, injustice when even when people think no one's watching uh, and we need to call it out. We need to have the courage to call it out. And we need never to forget why we have built some of the best nations in the world. And our democracies are amongst the best nations in the world. And the proof is in the fact that billions of people 
every year are trying to get into the United States and Canada and the UK and France and Germany. And we should ask ourselves, how did we achieve this success? And if we forget the fundamental reasons of why we got here, we will not be able to get to the next stage. And if that doesn't happen, if we don't continue to grow as democracies, I believe the rest of the world that is right now in peril is going to lose all hope for a better future. Well, thank you so much. That's a really important message to end on. Thank you for your kind words about our work. Uh, and, and thank you for everything that you do together with us. And um, lastly, thank you for your time today and for being our guest. Thank you, sir.